Hello everyone and welcome to another very exciting video in which we will talk about your favorite topic, visas for IMGs. This one will be dedicated to J1 for research scholars because multiple of you know you IMGs are coming to the US, they're doing research time in the US before they match into residency. And there are some nuances that come to the J1 visa for research, which is the most common type of visa that J1, uh, that research scholars are on. So that's why I brought an expert immigration lawyer who is specialized in visas for physicians to tell us all about that. Welcome, Naveen, again to the channel. Thank you. Uh, certainly, people who are aspiring for especially competitive residency spots will want to have a little bit of research on, on their resume before they apply. It makes them a lot more competitive. And the uh, the J-1 research is the the most appropriate for, for folks. And just um, some things to keep in mind for the J-1 research the J-1 um, is supported by the institution. So wherever you're going to be doing the the, the research, that medical center um, is probably affiliated with a university and they will have their own J-1 program. And so the, the DS-2019 form, which is what authorizes you for the J-1 program, would then be issued by the um, directly by the institution. Unlike J-1 for clinical the GME, which is done by ECFMG, the J1 for research is done directly by the um, by the medical center or the university where you're doing your research. The J1 research is limited to five years, and so every year you you'll get the J1 DS2019, and um, and you can use that document then to get the visa stamp issued. The um, the other uh, point to keep in mind is transitioning then from the J-1 research to the J-1 clinical. Um, you do want to be in communication with ECFMG because they are the organization supporting your J-1 for clinical. Um, they will want to see some type of connection between your research to the clinical, the, the nexus. Um, and so just have that dialogue with ECFMG to make sure that if this is your intended path, um, that that this will work out for you with ECFMG because they are ultimately the um, the agency that you will need to work with for your J1 clinical. These are great points, and you know if you've watched me uh, long enough, you know how much I love research, and I recommend people, especially for competitive specialties, to spend some time in the research. And that's why actually we have multiple courses to teach you how to do research and teach you how to come to the US and seek research positions, reach out to mentors. And you'll find the links for all these courses in the description of this video. And one question we get in the ring commonly is the two-year uh, home residency requirement. As you know, for J1 clinical, you're supposed to go back to your home country for two years and then come back if you want to pursue uh, other jobs in the U.S. or you want to get a green card. Does the same apply for research? It depends. So um, there are two ways to become subject to the two-year home residence requirement for research. One is if there's any kind of government funding. So if you receive a Fulbright, for example, or you receive any form of government funding from your home country to come to the U.S. for this research, then you are subject to that to your home residence requirement. Um, and those can be really difficult to obtain the waivers for, um, especially if it's a Fulbright. Then the other way to become subject is based on the State Department's skills list. So the State Department has a list of countries and certain fields that are considered to be underrepresented in that country. And so if your country is on the J-1 skills list, and then within that, your field that you're going to be engaged in is on the skills list, then based on that, you will become subject to that two-year home residence requirement. Being subject on the J-1 research to your home residence requirement will not prevent you from getting a J-1 for clinical, right? So you can still go back and get the J-1 for clinical. Um, you Being subject means that you can't get an H visa, uh, which is a common work visa, an L-1, which is an intercompany transfer work visa, or a green card until you get the waiver. But you can, you can get other visas such as the J-1 clinical, or you could get an O-1 as a person of extraordinary ability. So other than being from a certain country, there is also the category, like the type of research you do. For example, let's say somebody's from India and they come on a research visa. Is there a yes or no answer for them? Well, it depends on the type of research they're doing. Um, so I will have to double check this, but I believe India has been taken off the skills list. But so mm -hmm. the first thing is to see if the country's on the skills list. Mm -hmm. And then 
if it's on the skills list, they have different fields. And so if your field, um, which can be quite broad, like it could just mm -hmm. be like biomedical research or, or mm -hmm. science, or, you know, so depending on what the fields are under your country's listing, if, if it falls within that field, then you, um, you are a subject. I see. So if, hypothetically, let's say if India was on the list and they have agriculture under, you know, yeah. India, but they don't have medicine or biomedical, you yeah. can still come and you won't be subject to these two years. Right. That's correct. Right. And if um, there's an error and your visa says you're a subject, but you're actually not because mm -hmm. they, uh, then you can get an advisory opinion from the State Department and just clarify that that was a mistake and your field is not on the skills list. And so you should not be subject to the two year home residence requirement. Yeah. And I highly recommend for people to check that. And I'll leave the link for this list in the description of this video, because actually uh, one time my friend, uh, his country was not on the list and they put the that he's subject to the two year and he had to contact them and fix that because that will change what kind of visas he's on. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it has been recently changed. Um, so definitely look up the, the current skills list and see what fields are, are included. So another question that comes up is for the, those people who come to the U.S. on the J-1 research and they're married or they have children, do their dependents get a visa to come to the U.S. Uh, as dependents of that J-1 research person? Yes. So um, they're, if they're married, their spouse can apply for the J-2 and coming here on the J-2, they can apply for employment authorization document. Mm -hmm. um, their children can apply for the J-2 as well. Um, but to keep in mind that if the principal person is subject to the two-year home residence requirement, their accompanying family members are also subject. And does that apply to the children too or just the, the partner? No, nope, everyone. Wow. And another question that also comes up is the ability to work. So the EAD of the J2 will allow them probably to do anything they want in the U.S. Yeah. as you know, they can work whatever they want. But the J1 research person is very limited, right, in what they can do. So let's say they come on an unpaid research position in the U.S. Uh, what can, can they make money outside like Uber or Amazon or, you know, pizza delivery? No, no so uh, all the work visa categories and um, programs, uh, they are limited to just what you're approved for. There's, you're not able to do any side jobs. So if you're if you're here on a J-1 for research, you can only do that. You cannot um, do, you know, have any side moonlighting positions. Uh, in fact, if it's an unpaid position, then uh, then they'll want to make sure when you're applying for your J-1 visa that you have enough funds to support yourself so that you yeah. aren't in a position where you have to, um, to get a side job to supplement living costs, right? So uh, you will need to show that you have sufficient funds to support yourself through that research um, opportunity. Exactly. And most of the time, they also ask you for health insurance, uh, immunization documents. So make sure to have these ready. Uh, one question uh, I have from the points you mentioned, you said if you're a Fulbright Scholar, you cannot, uh, you're subject to the two-year requirement. Is yeah. that a Fulbright Scholar from your home country or from, from the U.S.? Um, so the Fulbright is actually a U.S. program, but it's um, there's it's supported through the home country, but it is considered a U.S. government program. And so it's very difficult to get a waiver of a Fulbright. Um, and we, you know, we actually had a case where just so, you know, a, a hardship waiver process takes mm -hmm. a very long time. It's it's a good two to three year long process because you first apply with the USCIS service center and you make the art, you know, explain why there would be hardship. Um, and then if the service center agrees, then they send it to the state department for their approval. And then the state department will reach out to Fulbright and other interested agencies to see if everyone agrees that this person should get a waiver. And it could be just a policy reason why they'll say no. So they may recognize the hardship, but if the overall policy is more important to the State Department, they're going to say no. And then uh, then you do need to then make sure you're going back home and completing your two-year obligation in your home country before you can come back to the U.S. on the green card. So that's why, you know, if, you're, if you have these nuanced situation or you're not sure about any question related to immigration, I highly recommend 
doctor, immigration lawyer who's specialized in that type of work so they can give you the advice that, you know, sometimes you make small mistakes and it affects your whole career and what you can do after. So thank you so much for Naveen for this extremely insightful discussion about the J1 research. For our viewers, if you're interested in coming to the U.S. to learn uh, research or to find a research position in the U.S., we have a phenomenal course. It's a live workshop that you can sign up to and learn how to find these institutions, how to find the mentors, how to reach out to them, get, give you an email template, CV template, prep you for the interview. We also have courses to teach you how to do research, how to do statistical analysis, systematic reviews, all this kind of stuff. And if you need help with any aspects when it comes to the visa part, don't hesitate to reach out to Naveen. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching, and good luck on your research journey.